Okay, if you're seated in the middle, please raise your hand if you have room next to you. If there's anyone on the edges or the outside that wants to come sit in the middle, please come. Or even better, people, please slide forward into the hole so we can open up space towards the back. That would be even better. All right. Yeah, let's get all hot and sweaty in this dome together. All right, we just have about one more minute until we're going to get started. For those of you who I haven't already met, my name is Liana Sananda Giluli, and I have the great pleasure of helping to run development for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, also known as MAPS. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's give it up for MAPS. MAPS is hosting the speaker series here at Burning Man, and we have some absolutely phenomenal, thrilling, and exciting guests all day today. And next up, we have an absolute rock star. He is one of the world's leading mycologists. He is saving the bees. He is discovering new species of mushrooms and new uses for mushrooms. The writers of Star Trek even created a character after him, the astromycologist Paul Stamets. And yeah. And I, I'd love to share a brief story. I had the great pleasure of visiting Paul up in his home in Cortez Island in the Pacific Northwest recently. And we were all standing around under a tree as he was pontificating on about beautiful discoveries with mushrooms and seven bald eagles began circling above his head. And then one of them landed directly on the tree he was standing under and I just thought, Paul, stop showing off. Okay, we get it. We get it. The voice of nature is speaking through Paul, the mushroom Lorax himself. Please welcome Paul Stamets. <laughs> well, greetings, folks. This is my eighth burn, so... Uh, but I've tripped on mushrooms many more times than that. So. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to cover a lot of territory very quickly. And I, I'm, uh, people are standing outside. I, I so wish that you could be inside. So thank you for, for pers persevering. And hopefully the audio will describe pictorially enough. So my talk is psilocybin mushrooms, intellectual activators for the paradigm shift. This is really, really important for us. So um, let's see if this works. Where's my clicker? It's supposed to be pointed to, okay. What a long, strange trip it's been. So I want to, I've had a series of epiphanies, and there are some self-evident truths in life that when it dawns upon you, you have the aha moment, and you know that intuitively, it's, it's, you've stumbled upon a universal truth. So I'm gonna go back to the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. This is from the Max Planck Institute. One parsec is 3.2 light years, 19 trillion miles. Look at the amount of uh, millions of parsecs up there, 125, 252. And the organization of the universe conforms to the same archetype that we uh, have uh, with mycelium, with neurons, and the computer internet. Nature builds upon its prior successes. It's inevitable, I think, that we'll find mycelial-like life forms throughout the entire cosmos. So looking at a deep field view, of the galaxies, um, and this is from the Hubble telescope. That is the lattice work of dark matter, and those ellipses there are individual galaxies. Again, the structure and the organization of matter in the universe conforms to the same archetype. I believe matter begets life, life becomes single cells, single cells become strings, linear, linear cells then branch, networks form, intersecting mosaics of networks then collaborate to form guilds, they create an ecosystem that gives rise to the diversity. And as through the diversity of our individualities that we have the resilience to be able to respond to catastrophia. We have entered into 6X, the sixth greatest extinction event known in the history of, of life on this planet. We are at a critical, critical time. We may be at the best of the last of times. What are all of you gonna to do to make a difference? Hearing the voices of your ancestors, hearing the voices of your descendants calling back in time, what are you gonna do? It's just not partying here at Burning Man. It's coming up with new solutions that could create a paradigm shift. I wanna lay the groundwork for some of that. So, 
We've had two extinction events caused by asteroids 250 million years ago, 65 million years ago. In both instances, after the impact, enormous amounts of debris jettisoned in the atmosphere. The sunlight was cut off. Plants and animals died. And then, because the, this extinction event with all these, all these debris fields have created, fungi surged, and literally fungi inherited the Earth. So looking at our beautiful blue planet today, we now know that recently, 2.4 billion years ago, the oldest evidence of a multicellular organism was found in South Africa in lava. 2.4 billion years ago, animals split from fungi. Well, let me, let me more accurately say that. Fungi gave birth to animals. Think of that, 650 million years ago, fungi gave birth to animals. 2.4 billion years ago, the oldest evidence of a multicellular organism is mycelium. That means all of us here today, we are descendant from mycelial networks. These are our, these are our, our elders, our ancestors. So the, the PT boundary is a very distinct boundary uh, geologically that we can see. And after these, these extinction events, then fungi surged. In fact, there's a fungus in the fossil record called Reduvia sporonides, and it gobbled up the forest after the big extinction event at the PT boundary 250 million years ago. Gondwana agaricides, magnificus, is a new species that was named from the fossil record, a fully intact mushroom, uh, evident 110 million years ago. Think of this, mushrooms had their forms long before primates, us primates had ours. In fact, way back when we were small little vole-like creatures, these are ancient organisms. The fact that they have their forms today and they exist are beacons of an ancestral knowledge evolutionarily going back hundreds of millions of years. So the mycelium of Psilocybe cubensis growing over eight days, and the largest organism in the world known today is a mycelial mat in eastern Oregon, 2,200 acres in size. Think of that. It's over 2,000 years of, of, in age, but it's one cell wall thick, surrounded by more than 1,000 species of bacteria per gram, more than eight miles of mycelium in a single cubic inch. It navigates through a microbial hostile environment. It pre-selects the microbiome surrounding it, so it creates a latticework of the soil microbiome that gives rise to the plants that feed the animals, that rises up to the canopy, that creates the trees, that create debris fields that feed the mycelial networks to then give uh, surety of the survival of the species going into the future. These are, these are uh, uh, primary organisms that are controlling the evolution of ecosystems for the benefit of the commons. This is so important to understand. So this is what we are facing uh, this year. An article came out, 40% of all known species are threatened and face extinction. We have about 8.3 million species on this planet. 30,000 species or more per year are going extinct. Do the math in 100 years, that's more than 3 million. That's more than a third of the known species that exist on this planet today. We are, our biodiversity is unraveling underneath our feet. When we lose the soil biome, we lose the ecosystems that have gotten us here today through some very smart uh, evolutionary decisions, we are really unraveling the very life support systems of this planet. And now, this article came out, I think, a year and a half ago, 75% decline over the past 27 years in the total flying insect biomass in protected areas. This is not in the cities. These are in protected forests. Remember the days, not uh, 10, 20 years ago, when you had bug splatter on your windshield? Many of you drove across country. You know, 20, 30 years ago, you'd have to stop at gas station to clear off your windshield because of the bug splatter. We don't have that anymore. So this is a tremendous threat. And those, uh, Bill Gates, as much as I admire him in some ways, and Chris Anderson at TED said, I don't like mosquitoes. Why don't we just kill all the mosquitoes? Well, if you didn't have mosquitoes, you wouldn't have chocolate. Okay, mosquitoes pollinate calcutra trees. We are so interconnected uh, with the insect uh, biome. It is critically important that we protect. So I'm going to go to the, 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 the mushroom life cycle. This is super simplified here. Two spores come together. They mate. They have sex, basically. Uh, they then become binucleate from a single nucleate cell. They become binucleate. And then the mycelium exists for months. Uh, um, uh, years before a single mushroom will form. The mushrooms are at the very end of the life cycle. 
more than 40% more genes are activated in the mycelial state than at the fruit body, the mushroom state. The mycelium is to a mushroom what the roots are to a tree. And so those of you who are, uh, under, uh, un understand uh, tree biology, it's now well accepted that a tree is just a laminated root that goes all the way down into the soil and the root goes all the way up into the tree. The mycelium is made of compacted, uh, the mushrooms are made of compacted mycelium. So <clears throat> looking at the mycelium, that was a scanning electron mic microscopist for many years, under for the conditions of introduction, introduction of water, rain, dropping of temperature, evaporation. Um, the mycelium wicks up, exhales uh, carbon dioxide, inhales oxygen, just like we do, and then exposure to light. Mushrooms are triggered in the formation. Primordia are formed. They very, very quickly mature. And very interestingly, blue light is a critically important for the production of psilocybin. And also blue light is critically important for the mycelium to produce a fruit body, a mushroom. So Psilocybe cubensis is the most popular cultivated psilocybin mushroom in the world. But these mushrooms come up, they quickly mature, and they, in a matter of a few days, they begin to rot. And as they rot, the spores germinate, lots of other microbes take advantage of the fleshy fruit body. Mushrooms invite themselves to be consumed. This is extremely important for them to be spread. Mushrooms do not have a good immune system. The mycelium that gives rise to the mushrooms have an excellent immune system and we can harvest the immune attributes of the mycelium to, for our, our own host defense of immunity, far better than that of the fruit bodies. So there's up to eight miles, as I mentioned, of mycelium in a single cubic inch. It's the extracellular metabolites that are being expressed by the mycelium that is part of the intermolecular communication channel that allows the mycelium to navigate through hostile environments, making contact with the pathogenic bacteria, upregulating anti-then bacterial compounds, messenger molecules exploring the ecosystem, trying to design epigenetically how to be able to respond to a new food source, a, a potential confrontation with a pathogen, or reaching it and creating a commensal relationship with the beneficial bacteria. And these guilds of organisms then uh, are propelled by these mycelial mats as they cruise underground, invisible to you, uh, underneath every footstep that you take. You're leaving upon impressions over, over hundreds and hundreds of miles of mycelium. So how many primates, I wondered, actually consume mushrooms? Well, 22 primates are known to consume mushrooms, 23 with humans. And interesting, the Golgi monkey consumes more than 12 times its body weight. It's a Brazilian monkey um, in, in a year. But this is phenomenal consumption compared to what we consume in North America. It's about you know, two to three pounds per year. So the fact that there's 23 primates that consume mushrooms speaks to me. There's been a long evolutionary association of primates and mushrooms who have selected out mushrooms that are beneficial. There's about... Um, 1.5 million species of fungi, 150,000 mushroom forming fungi, and about 14,000 species have been identified. So, two million years ago, uh, uh, there was a sudden ex explosion in the size of the primate brain. And Homo sapiens only appeared about 200,000 years ago. From an evolutionary point of view, this is an extraordinary uh, change um, in, in the brain uh, uh, neural system. How is that possible and why? Well, it happened, interestingly, at a time of radical climate change. And the ability of then of the primates to adapt to climate change allowed them to better survive. So uh, Alex Gray made this fantastic image that Natalie so, so nicely showed as well. And Homo erectus and uh, Neanderthals moved into Europe well before uh, Homo sapiens did. And interestingly, I did a 23Me test. I have 3.5% Neanderthal. Woo! <laughs> so, but interesting, within 4,000 years of contact, Homo sapiens make Neanderthals extinct. Even though they buried their dead, they made fire, they had rudimentary art. So it's really interesting. Why is it that Homo sapiens had a competitive advantage used to Neanderthals? Well, this is from my friend Louis Schwartzberg, who's showing a, a movie later on tonight, Fantastic Fungi, at 9 o'clock here, so I hope you can come and see it. And Louis and I have been uh, uh, cooperating on making this movie for over 10 years, and so he was able to animate the Stone Ape hypothesis. 
And here's our primate ancestors walking across the savanna. Most primates eat grub, eat insect larvae. You find a fleshy mushroom, you're hungry, you're with your family, you share it, you consume the mushroom, and then, whoa. Okay. So suddenly, you know, a whole new world opens up. Now, how often does this happen? It wouldn't happen once or twice three times, thousand times, millions times. It happened millions upon millions upon millions of times over millions upon millions and millions of years. Epigenetically, that's gonna have an effect on your neural structure. And if you're smarter, you're able to have better cognition, better planning, better survival skills, better, better tools. You know, strategically, you can then overcome many of the obstacles that otherwise cause you to become extinct. Slosby cubensis is quite common. It is the most common large dung and dwelling mushroom in the subtropics and tropics. It is unmistakable. You can't, if you're hungry, walking across the plains, tracking animals, you find these fleshy fungi, you're very likely to want, if you're hungry, to consume them. So this is not something that's an abstract idea. This is an idea that I think it resonates because it circumstantially just seems to be true. So, it, now, Terence and Dennis McKenna proposed it as a theory. Um, I would say back then it was a hypothesis, and a hypothesis is an educated guess. A theory is a hypothesis that's been tested. Now, with the evidence that's been coming out on psilocybin, I agree with Natalie that the hypothesis is now indeed a, a becoming a valid theory. There's just so much evidence that's being, that's the compounding to make this um, to be true. So psilocybin de de degrades into psilocybin. Psilocybin is really a, a pro-drug. Psilocin is what gets you high. Um, it dephosphorylates in metabolism. So the bee shaman is a 7,000 year old, and the first image you're gonna see is the original uh, pictograph in the caves in, northern, uh, in, in the southern Algeria, the Sahara Desert, in the Ticillian and Jar Plateau. So that's the original pictograph. And then my friend Jonathan Mead and, uh, and made it more distinct. But it's very clear that the artist was excited about mushrooms. And historically, in many indigenous uh, cultures, especially in Mesoamerica, it is, all, it is it continues to this day to put magic mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms, in the honey. And so that's a way of preserving them. So that tradition goes back many, many millennia, and probably you know, even um, in, into Africa and early Europe. I want you to pay attention to this for a second. Memory map this image, because I'm gonna come back to it with something I think is, is just is shook me to my core. So the interesting about psilocybin, it has, the, uh, it has functions to be able to, uh, to get rid of the, the, trace, uh, the, the fear condition response. And a very interesting article, uh, a series of articles have come out, many of you know about this, for treating PTSD, uh, um, uh, trauma, be able to reconcile childhood um, um, issues that have occurred into adulthood. And so, um, now this is a fantastic uh, a connectogram showing the a placebo effect on how well integrated your brain neurons are versus being on psilocybin. And Nancy Reagan, if you were here today, <laughs> <laughs> just say yes. <laughs> don't, don't say no. Which brain would you rather have? I think I'd rather have a brain that was smarter than one that was dumber. So, but this is interesting because psilocybin induces neurogenesis. We know that. Well, psilocybin also indu induces courage. Uh, because one of the things with, with psilocybin and, and PTSD and the conditioned fear response is after using psilocybin, you're able to overcome your fears. And when you then are, have a stimulus that's been associated with, a, with pain, a tragedy, you're able to dissociate that. So if you're being attacked by saber-toothed tigers, your clans have been de devastated, you trip on mushrooms, you have a new idea for being able to compete against the saber-toothed tigers, then you, when you face them again, you, you have the courage to be able to move forward. And also, it, in, it induces kindness. Well, you know what, folks? These are leadership skills. And it leads to better citizenship. So I can think of a few politicians that could well do with several heavy doses of psilocybin. 
So these um, Mesoamerican mushroom stones primarily found in the Mayan, uh, the Mayan region, the Pacific slopes of Guatemala. There's about 200 of these in the world. I am the temporary caretaker right now of, of 23 of these. They have come to me through different estates that have been passed on to me uh, by elders who said that Paul will know what to do with these. I fully intend to return them to the Mayan culture. The one in the center is 2,500 years old and they were made all the way up into about 500 um, um, AD, um, about 1,500 years ago, uh, long before the conquistadors uh, came. But the Pope, uh, when the conquistadors came, decreed that these mushroom stones were idols and summarily ordered them to be destroyed by the thousands because they brought in venereal diseases, uh, putatively, debatably tuberculosis, not, uh, not debatably smallpox. The, the, the European diseases devastated the indigenous population and the shaman's medicine did not work. So many of them converted, converted, uh, converted to Catholicism and in doing so started snitching on their neighbors. And so these were buried in order to hide their mushroom stones from those uh, from the conquistadors and Catholicism. Um, Natalie showed the, inf the infamous or the famous uh, Life magazine in 1957. Millions of this were delivered on, the, on Americans and Canadian doorsteps uh, right in the middle of the Cold War. It was actually a field guide to how to find psilocybin mushrooms. And Maria Sabina you know, gave these to R. Gordon Wasson. And my, this is my brother John presenting a psilocybin to me, myself. And this is uh, a Demeter giving Persephone a mushroom as well. But notice the, the way that the mushrooms are presented. It's not like just here, some mushroom. It's presente. You have something sacred, look at this. And I think this is a universal gesture of those people who have understood that these mushrooms are so critically important. So I'd like to give an acknowledgement to my four uh, individuals who most influenced me. This is on the upper left, Dr. Michael Bug. We, uh, Michael Bug uh, received a Drug Enforcement Administration license at the Evergreen State College. Uh, Mike wrote the protocol, basically the original protocol that accurately identified psilocybin from other serotonin-like tryptamines. Dr. Alexander Smith wrote a monograph on the genus Psilocybe, 1957. And Dr. Daniel Stuntz on the lower left, and then Catherine Skates. I met them, and I was self-taught when I was about 17 years of age, basically going into university libraries trying to find literature, much of which was razored out of books. And so I ended up going deeper into the field of mycology to get access to information. But these individuals took me under their wing, and it's quite surprising because two of them were very conservative, and that's what I looked like. <laughs> so, um, in uh, 1977, uh, Dr. Gaston Guzman, Gary Menser, a person I don't know, Stephen Pollock, an MD, myself, and, uh, and Dale Leslie, went on a tr an extraordinary four or five week um, tra traveling from Northern California to British Columbia. And we kept on finding psilocybes all, everywhere we went. Even out in Vancouver, uh, BC, we parked the car, opened the car door, psilocybe stuntsii was growing by the thousands right where we parked. It was crazy, the mushrooms came to us, we didn't have to go to them. So this populated many of the specimens for good Dr. Gaston Guzman's monograph on the genus psilocybe. And then Michael Bugh, who's a lovable, nerdy professor. I love him so much, he's still alive. And, um, but his students were Jonathan Ott. Many of you know Jonathan Ott, Pharmacotheon, um, and Jeremy Bigwood and myself. And the three of us went ahead, and I think we published now 17 books. So under his umbrella of the DEA license, we were able to get a, a lot of research done. So our great, great friend, Terrence McKenna, Dr. Andrew Weil, Gary Menser, and Stephen Pollock. So, for 40 years, um, I was principally an organizer of psychedelic mushroom, mushroom, uh, mushroom conferences, called the Mycomedia Conferences, and then at the Millennium Mushroom Conference in 1999, I'm friends with the Merry Pranksters and the Grateful Dead uh, group community. I also was friends with Sasha Shulgin and the psychedelic researchers, and I realized I'm right in the middle between these two groups when I bring them together. So we did. We had the most crazy conference you can imagine. <laughs> Every, everybody tripped on about 12 species of psilocybin mushrooms. The next, 
The next day I said, I'm, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> so my good friend Ken Kesey, uh, Ken um, is it with the Merry Pranksters. Most of you know who Ken Kesey was, I hope you. Yeah. So um, Ken Keyes and I share two things in common. We both love tractors, and we both were loggers. I'm, I'm good at a few things, but I'm good with, really good with a chainsaw. And so anyhow, I created chainsaw oil, biodegradable, with uh, 100 million, 200 million spores of Psilocybe azurescens that you can put into your chainsaw. And as you're chainsawing the wood, the chainsaw bar oil is inoculating the wood. <laughs> and so, and d d during one journey, I was tripping my brains out, and this phrase came to me, omni psilocybe munda, you know, omni psilocybe munda. So, anyhow, omni psilocybe munda, you know, third planet productions, you know, spores do, do, do illuminatus. This is a way of getting the psilocybes to grow in your backyard. Very, very cool. Very discreet, you know. <laughs> Take note. Okay. <clears throat> Lots of books came out in the 1970s. I have this four of mine, five of my books. And then the, the greatest book, the funnest, most fun book is The Golden Guide to Hallucinogenic Plants. You know, what every third grader needs to be able to identify. <laughs> All the psychoactive plants in North America. Great, you know, so. The story behind this is the Golden Guide um, family. Uh, the hippie son inherited the Golden Guide company, and he was a total psychonaut. So he went ahead and had this produced. It had one press run. And then the PTAs, this is in the 1970s, the, the Parent Teacher Association got wind of this and absolutely you know, threatened to cancel Golden Guide's you know, contracts, and so they dropped the book. This was selling for $4.95. It's now worth over $500 a copy. I foolishly bought 200 of them and gave them away. So, maybe not foolishly. So, Slosby Cubensis became part of the college scholarship fund uh, throughout the 70s and 80s. Uh, people growing uh, psilocybin mushrooms in their closets and in their basements. Um, and many tuitions of many very well known people um, that I am privy to have their confidence in. Uh, paid for their collegiate education, uh, you know, by growing psilocybin mushrooms, you know, in their dormitories, et cetera. And these people are not making tons of money. They're just being, paying their rent, buying food, reinvesting in, uh, money back into their local community, right? So that was primarily what was happening at that time. I have uh, published now four psilocybin mushroom species, Psilocybe algerescens, Psilocybe liniformis variety americana, Psilocybe cinnaferbulosa and Psilocybe wileyi. So there, I have two or three other species that I have not gone around to publish, but there's about 215 psilocybin active mushroom species in the world, um, and there's a lot more to be discovered. Um, so it's very interesting because after all this time, there's several more species. There is a report of a child dying in 1960, 1961, in Kelso, Washington, from eating a, a putatively called Psilocybe cubensis, and that uh, Psilocybe assistus, and that led on to the discovery of a novel uh, uh, psilocybin-like tryptamine that was named baocystin. This is a subject for another talk, but something that um, some researchers really re-examine uh, baocystin and what it is. It is not toxic. I think it was, it was, it was the uh, article mis, uh, blamed a magic mushroom uh, in absence of other, uh, other information on mushrooms growing in the same yard. So Psilocybe stuntsii is extremely common in Washington and Oregon and British Columbia. Psilocybe cyanescens, the wavy cap, is, uh, grows from uh, basically Santa Barbara all the way up uh, to British Columbia. Now it's been naturalized uh, back east. Psilocybe alenii is also one that's all over the Bay Area. And these species tend to be um, concentrated around churches, courthouses, law enforcement facilities, <laughs> universities, Apple campus, Google campus, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uh, campus. There's a theme here, folks. 
the, the invention of, of use of beauty bark and wood chips, the psilocybin mushrooms have localized themselves closest to the thought leaders and people in positions of power and authority. That is not an accident, as Natalie mentioned. These mushrooms and plants may be using us and have been using us as vehicles. So a very poisonous mushroom that you all should know is Gallerana atomnalis, also known as Gallerana marginata. It contains the alpha ammonitin compounds, which are deadly poisonous. They oftentimes grow side by side. So that photograph on the right, there is a deadly poisonous mushroom with rusty brown spores, and this Lassabe stuncii on the left with purple brown spores. You're an eager young person, you're looking for psilocybin mushrooms, it's very likely that you would pick both of those. And the one on the right can kill you and has killed people looking for psilocybin mushrooms. So there's a number of field guides out there. I have one called Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World that can help you uh, identify mushrooms, uh, psilocybin mushrooms without danger of misidentification. Psilocybe semilanciata is, is a pastoral species growing in sheep fields and horse, uh, horse pastures and cattle ranches and localized oftentimes where there's swampy land or around ponds. Psilocybe pelliculosa is a woodland species that's, that grows along trails, very rarely ever found in the deep woods. Again, it's associated with trails made by humans. These things are following the footsteps of humans as we create debris fields from nature. And I think that is, is interesting because I feel these mushrooms are calling out to us. They've called out to me and they have led me down a path of discovery which I'm really, really honored to be able to share with you. But some of the research, and um, others may have talked about this, but there's about eight, um, eight to 10 recent uh, clinical studies start, starting with Johns Hopkins and Dr. Roland Griffiths uh, talking about the benefits of psilocybin mushrooms um, being one of the most spiritually potent experiences of a life. And also the residual effects uh, could be measured months, even years subsequently. Is a retroactive study looking at 480,000 uh, basically prisoners from the US uh, 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 HHS services. And there's an extraordinary association. Now association is not necessarily causation, but it can be. But looking at these, the, these prisoners, those who had a, with a one-time use of psilocybin had a 27% decrease odds of larceny, past year larceny or theft, 22% decrease odds for property, 18% decrease odds for a violent crime. Wow, psilocybin mushrooms can prevent people from becoming criminals. And yet we criminalize people for the possession of psilocybin mushrooms. That is totally hypocritical. It's totally contrary to the evidence that we're seeing. So this extraordinary one from a researcher in British Columbia with 1,266 community members between the ages of 16 and 17, very interesting, saw a negative correlation between psychedelic use and inherent uh, intimate partner violence. Interestingly, so if you were in a relationship with another person, a man, and that man had tripped on mushrooms, statistically significant nonviolence associated with that relationship. But it didn't cross over for women, which is very curious. So women and men, if you've got a, a husband or a boyfriend, who's tripped on mushrooms is probably a better partner than one who has not. So you might want to, you might want to, uh, the first questions we're going to start dating is, have you tripped on psilocybin? Mm -hmm. You have? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, this is a, this is the, uh, the big push right now from a number of groups is um, treatment resistant depression using psilocybin. And um, so there's a reset uh, mode network. I think others have already just uh, ta talked about this. So I'm just going to briefly survey the literature here. And then for psychiatric disorders, psilocybin presents a whole new modality of being able to treat psychiatric uh, disorders with a non addictive uh, drug in a totally different category. The amazingly cool thing about psilocybin, besides it being so profound and so effective, when you go on a deep journey, at least with me and people I know, the next morning, after you've tripped on five grams of cubensis, you've seen God, you've you know, connected with the universe, your heart chakra has opened up, you've connected. The next morning you look at those mushrooms and you go, no way. <laughs> I'm not touching that for a long time. 
So, um, because they have, they're non-addictive. They, you know, as Terrence McKenna said, if, you know, when you, when you get the message, hang up the phone. I think he ripped that off from Alan Watts, actually, but, um, but I think that's, that's very interesting. It also has a pro-democracy influence. So those people who have taken psilocybin mushrooms tend to resist um, authoritarian views. Wow. Trump supporters, are you listening? <laughs> Sorry, I should not get political. Um, so this is at Johns Hopkins, that little mushroom stone in the back there. Uh, my friend Dusty and I made about 20 of those and we were shocked that when we visited that that mushroom stone was in a place there were 700 sessions of people tripping on psilocybin at Johns Hopkins and our handiwork was there. So we were there with over 700 patients and uh, they just happened to receive one of these. We made 20 of them and the mold broke. So many, how many people here read Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind? Well, Michael Pollan and I uh, spent about a week and a half together, and I was in a restaurant in Oregon, and, I, and my, Michael and I, as you, people read the book know, I spent an in interesting time collecting magic mushrooms, and when I was sitting at the restaurant, I said, Michael, you know, mushrooms changed my mind. And I went, oh, that's interesting. And that became the title of the book. So a uh, little backstory there. But um, so Michael's a good egg. Um, it was a great bridge to those people who have not experimented with psychedelics. Um, my, my friend uh, told me it was like, uh, it's like my summer vacation on psychedelics for us veteran psychonauts. But I applaud Michael for, for bringing this to the mainstream. He's done a great job. So he's a, he's a good buddy. So it's interesting that, um, that there's also a pro-environmental influence. So not only is it anti-authoritarian, not only is it anti-violence, anti-criminal, but there's also a pro-environmental pro influence of behavior. This speaks to the fact that maybe these mushrooms are trying to condition our psyche to be better Earth citizens, to take care of the ecosystems that give us life and give them life, and that they are stewards of the, of the ecological consciousness of nature. So there's a huge in, uh, interest in psychedelic medicine in the Silic Silicon Valley, especially for microdosing. I call it epigenetic neurogenesis. And there's been a proposal now, but Roland Griffiths uh, being the prime, one of the prime authors is to move psilocybin from schedule one to schedule four. Usono, Usono spoke yesterday. Some of the Usono researchers are here. They're now recruiting for about 80 or 90 uh, patients. Um, for uh, depressive disorders approved by the FDA. I know Comp uh, MAP, uh, Compass is, is do doing also research in, that re uh, research in that regard. Johns Hopkins has an Alzheimer's clinical study um, that is going to be launching in the fall um, for those uh, individuals showing uh, uh, the characteristics of uh, early onset Alzheimer's. So there's a huge, huge uh, um, movement right now on multiple fronts by different research groups, specifically using psilocybin. So I want to show you a microdosing formula. But before I do that, here's Psilocybe azurescens, Psilocybe cyanescens. Now look at the two of them side by side. Those of you who experience cyanescens, look how big azurescens is. This is a very, very big psilocybin mushroom. So I came up with blue juice. And so several chemists are here in the audience, and I want you to pay attention to this because it's very counterintuitive. And it took me a long time to figure this out. Um, I was first shown a little uh, blue juice by a, a hippie in the 1970s. He wouldn't tell me how he made it. And I tried boiling mushrooms in water and doing all this stuff, and it finally dawned on me, why don't I use ice cubes? So I take vodka, but I take the mushrooms, I chop them up, put them into uh, ice cubes, and then let the ice cubes melt over five days at one degree uh, Celsius, 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Very, very slow melt. And when it melts, it extracts the psilocybin and psilocin, but not the polysaccharides. And then, then you can make blue juice, and, it's, and then you can pour these into ice cube trays, and you can have blue ice cubes for the playa. <laughs> Why not? 
Okay, so some of the novel research that we just, I'm going to show you th uh, two or three images of what we just have been do doing. Now, uh, these are psilocybin analogs. These are legal. And I'd like to acknowledge and send my gratitude to the USANA Institute and Bill Linton for providing these legal psilocybin analogs. I do not have a DEA license, so I don't grow psilocybin mushrooms and I can't uh, work with them. But we found there was three analogs that we described and comparing it to uh, nerve growth factors, induction, over several treatments, and this is a, a brain glia cells, compared to the positive controls, which is a neurostimulant uh, derived from, from young neurons, this compound here in the center, in the purple, showed a remarkable ability of increasing neurogenesis. So um, Alex and Bill Linton and uh, Poncho talked about promiscuous molecules, things that co-elute out uh, with psilocybin. And this is really interesting to me because if you just go to a pure ph pharmaceutical of psilocybin as a structure, you may not get, you won't get these other compounds. And so we are now narrowing down to neurogenic uh, um, compounds that are associated with psilocybin, which are legal, um, which is kind of showing a remarkable increase in, in, in neurogenesis. There's another mushroom called a smart, what I shall call a smart mushroom, the second one, uh, it's lion's mane mushrooms. There's two clinical studies showing that lion's mane mushrooms uh, helps early stage dementia and, and also depression. And it regenerates myelin on the uh, nerves of the uh, on axons. Myelin is the conductive sheath that transmits nerve signals. And so psilocybin causes the proliferation of the nerve tips. Lion's mane uh, helps regeneration of myelin there's really good studies on this. If you Google Stamets and Lion's Mane, uh, Huffington Post, I have a series of articles on medicinal mushrooms and Lion's Mane uh, reports on the, some of the research. So the amyloid plaque formation is associated with Alzheimer's. It could be an artifact, but nevertheless, demyelination co-occurs with the formulation, uh, formation of amyloid plaques. So, uh, interferes with neurotransmission and post-mortem, you know, if you have a relative and their brains have been uh, resected, they use an amyloid stain and they see these amyloid plaques and they're characteristic of neurodegeneration associated with Alzheimer's. So we recently just got this test back from Neurofit from France and then we found that the lion's mane mycelium increased in the matter of just a few, uh, seven days in sextipulate uh, six replicates there, that is an 8% increase over uh, brain-derived nerve growth factor. This is substantial. So we know we have evidence of neurogenesis from psilocybin in the hippocampus. We know there are some good clinical studies, although small, showing lion's mane ingestion of mycelium, not the fruit bodies, uh, causes uh, d d d demonstrably improvements in neurological tests. And then, so the, in this in vitro test, now we've been able to show that compared to brain growth nerve factors, lion's mane mycelium also causes neurogenesis. 8% increase in neurogenesis is, is very, very substantial. So lion's mane, so the, this is the conundrum that's being faced is that it's up to $7,000 per gram for pure psilocybin. Now that's greatly exaggerated, I admit, because chemists here can do that for a lot less. But if you grow psilocybin mushrooms, for $2 a pound, four to $5 a pound fresh, it's $4 a kilo uh, dry, 0.4 grams, you end up with a, about psilocybin for about equivalency of $4 a gram. So growing the mushrooms naturally is, is much, much better. So here's the stacking formula that I propose, and I've reduced it now to 1 20th of a gram of psilocybin mushrooms because I feel liftoff at a 10th of a gram sometimes. So we don't want to have liftoff, we add the, air, the lion's mane, and we stack it with niacin so it becomes the ant abuse for microdosing. Because if you had a niacin flush, and if you tried to take 10 to 20 time, uh, 20 of those pills with that formula, you'd be taking you know, several grams of niacin, and the niacin flush causes itching, reddening, it's very uncomfortable. Neuropathies oftentimes present themselves as deadening of the nerve endings at the toes and the fingertips. And so the idea is to drive the neurogenic benefits to the endpoints of the nervous system using niacin. Niacin also has adverse effects if you take too much. 
They stack up with lion's mane and psilocybin, and I think this is an excellent a formula to be tested for neurogenesis, um, for being able to make people smarter and healthier. Oh, I wasn't supposed to show this slide. <laughs> Okay, you didn't see that, and I didn't say anything. Hmm. Well, very interesting that the low doses of psilocybin in this study is a very interesting study with mice, and they were put on to, into a cage with a metal floor, and they were, they were given a tone, dong, and then 40 seconds later, there was, there was electrical shock, you know, uh, in, in the floor. And so after 10 cycles, when they heard the tone, the mice cowered in fear, expecting that they would have a shock in 40 seconds. They conditioned, it's a conditioned fear response. And so then when they dosed the mice, subsequently, at high doses, equivalent to some of the therapeutic doses being used right now in clinical studies, it took more than 10 cycles of no shock, subsequent to psilocybin exposure at high dose, before they dissociated the tone with the shock. Interestingly, at microdoses, it only took two repetitions. And it showed that microdoses were more effective at dissociating the conditioned fear response than macrodoses. I think that's, that really needs to be pursued. So, uh, less may be better, especially over the long term. It doesn't get, does not get weirder than this. It was recently discovered that cicadas, and I've, how many people have seen, every 17 years cicadas come out? How many people have seen cicada bursts? I was a, grew up in northern Ohio, crazy in the summertime. And all these cicadas, they make so much noise, and then they start dying off, and they get fuzzy butts. It was, I was only 12 years old or something when it happened, when I went on the cicada outburst. I wish I knew back then that they found that the cicadas, and this, this fungus, Massapora, is packed full of psilocybin. And the cicadas come out and after they mature and they reproduce, the uh, massospora infected with this, uh, this fungus when it infects the cicadas of the males and it literally rots off their butts and it rots off their genitalia. And it, then it feminizes them to adopt the feminine seduction dance around non-infected cicadas so the male cicadas are seduced to come closer to now a neutered male infected with psilocybin fungus, so that then the spores will infect the male. And it's packed full of amphetamines because it's lost its digestive system, and so there's enough amphetamines to agitate the now infected neutered psilocybin cicada to have the energy to go in this sexual and uh, seductive dance to get more cicadas infected. So I looked it up, 10 minutes, oh boy. How is that possible? I say 14, but anyhow. So it's not 2034, it's 2033. In the year 2033, we could have a Massapora, a mass Massapora psilocybin party here at Burning Man, okay? <laughs> Mark your calendar, okay. Okay, so I want to bring you back to this. And I, I have 14 minutes according to my clock, Leanna, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it. But, so there are some images and some messages in nature that resonate through time. And this is one that I have seen this image for 25, 30 years. And it subliminally suggested something to me that I think has resulted in a paradigm shift that could save literally millions of lives. So this is the, one of my greatest inventions of all time. We go back to the bee shaman. You saw this before. The association of mushrooms and bees. Well, it turns out the bees are dying massively across the planet. It is a biggest threat to worldwide food biosecurity. One of every three bites that you have in the, in the store is dependent upon bees. This is your dairy selection at Whole Foods with bees, dairy selection without bees. We are undergoing a massive extinction event of wild bees and also honey bees, Apis mellifera. In the United States last year, commercial beehives 
84% in Oklahoma, 74% in approximately in, in Maryland. Average die-off is 40% of bees hives are dying. I have 10 beehives. You go out on a Monday, your bees are fine. You go out on Thursday, they're all gone. But they're not dead end hive, they're gone. And what happens is bees used to fly for nine days. We see bees on a flower that last nine days of their lives. Now it's been shortened to four days. A bee can pollinate a thousand flowers a day. That's a thousand almonds per day, per bee. So when you have only four days, rather than nine days, you've gone from 9,000 almonds to 4,000 4, almonds. So there's lots of stressors. Neonicotinoids are a big one, loss of habitat, poor bee nutrition, pathogens, especially mites that carry viruses and pesticides. This is the deformed wing virus. There's a wild bumblebee, and there is a wild bumblebee with a deformed wing virus. Look at that poor bee. That bee can't fly. It walks, and then is not able to pollinate. The deformed wing virus has become a pandemic that spread throughout the entire world. All bees now are infected with these viruses, the Varroa destructor virus, the deformed wing virus, the Lake Sinai virus, and, and, um, and the black queen cell virus. This is now, when an infected by, uh, honeybee goes to a, a flower, it leaves viral particles, and then a bumblebee, a wild bee comes, visits the same flower, it's infected. And so the wild bees are hard to calculate because there's only 100 to 200 in the ground, you have a beehive, it's above ground, you're taking care of the beehives, you can see the bees die or not be there. So the wild bees are very hard to be able to measure, but we know they're dying off in massive quantities. So the deformed wing virus has been identified as the number one cause of prior new colony collapse. It's been injected by the Varroa mite, and 100% of honeybee colonies in the world are now infected. It's a global pandemic. It's the leading contender, contender for colony collapse disorder across the world. These are all scientific papers that have used the most modern techniques to identify. I started doing research with mycelium of polypore mushrooms with Washington State University. We identified a number of polypore mushrooms that not only helped the bees in, the, in their vitality, but increased their lifespan statistically. Dr. Steve Shepard said an entomologist of more than 40 years of experience, he's never seen anything that's extended the lifespan of bees more than this. In some cases, doubling the lifespan of bees. This is so important, especially during their pollination stage. So we started doing some research experiments. We did the largest uh, bee clinical study in history, 532 beehives in the almond orchards of California. And we narrowed it down to three mushroom species, two polypore mushrooms, reishi, uh, Ganoderma lucidum, and Ganoderma resinaceum, and amadou. And the results I'm summarizing here very quickly. Again, it's a deformed wing virus. Look at this statistical significance for those of you who are, who are science nerds. This is as good as it gets, you know, 0. 0.00001. And, then, and of reishi and amadou, Dr. Uh, Jay Evans, the lead virologist at the USDA, um, is, he was a bee, bee virus scientist all of his life, has never seen such activity. In fact, there is no antiviral ever demonstrated to reduce viruses in bees before of this. None, whatsoever. So against the black queen cell virus, more than 500 reduction you know, using chaga and reishi. So the queens against the Lake Sinai virus, 45,000 to one. This is one treatment of one drop per 100 drops of wa uh, sugar water. So it's 10 mils per 1,000 mils, basically 1%. And I want to challenge all of you out there, just think about this, especially scientists and physicians. Can any of you send me literature, paulstamets at gmail.com, where you ever have seen a natural product reduce a pathogen more so than a pharmaceutical? Think of that. Is there any natural product out there more powerful than a pure drug that reduces a pathogen? I'd like to see that literature, because I, I don't know of any. So, with a summary of this, 
we have a multi, uh, we are, have a multiplicity of benefits against several B viruses uh, using these polypore mushrooms that grow in the woods, in the forest. This is orally active, past ingestion, the microbiome, the cytochrome P450 pathway, which we all use for detoxification. And so this is, this is basically a animal clinical study. Bees are the second most well-studied animal in the world. So this is not an in vitro study. This is a animal clinical study. The humans are the most well-studied animal in the world. Bees are the second most. So the, I stumbled upon this. We all grew up with Winnie the Pooh, and yet no one had made this discovery before me. This is crazy. I filed patents on this. I received now about 32 patents. Um, I, United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Europe, and Eurasia. I've open sourced it for India, Africa, South America, Mexico, the majority of the world. So my motto is you have to be profitable to be charitable. I have to admit, and I, I wanted to open source this for the world, but when I looked at Monsanto and Dow and Syngenta, they would greenwash this. They would use this to be able to disguise what they were actually making their money on. And so I thought, I'm gonna go for patentability here. When I first got the patent award, for five seconds my ego swelled, and I said, really? We all grew up with Winnie the Pooh? If there's any mention of this in any literature, scientific or general literature, that bees would benefit from mycelium immunologically to reduce viruses, I would not have gotten these patents. The fact that I've gotten them now in so many different countries, in so many different languages, with all the databases, it truly brings home the message to me that we are Neanderthals with nuclear weapons. We don't have the foggiest idea about what the intelligence of nature is literally underneath our feet and around us. <laughs> so our bee team here, my 10 beehives, so we did a promotion uh, through our company. We did end caps with QR codes and to support Washington State University and I encourage people here to do so. And we got the report back and I couldn't believe it, but our campaign, which they didn't have to buy from us, just a QR code, iPhone or Droid going by, scan up, boom, I pay, bam, $5 WSU. We raised $5 million. <laughs> But this research would not have been possible if it wasn't for my good friends, uh, Lee and June Stein, who were early, early adopters and who said, Paul, do nothing else, focus on this. So thank you so much. And there are great friends and long-term burners, and they contributed the first $400,000, which got this research really going. So the five million is just keeping the research continuing. Okay, so we had to publish. We did. We published in Nature. I'm the lead author. Jay Evans is the co-author. Uh, Steve Shepard is the co-author. So we published in Nature Scientific Reports. Many of you know Nature is one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world. Only 7% of the articles submitted to Nature get published. Because of our p-value significance, we're so strong. We actually had stronger ones, but, but, but uh, stronger activity, but lower, but not as good p-values. We passed peer review, and our article to this day is in the top 1% of more than 280,000 articles now published in the Nature publication ecosystem. We're in the top 1% of all articles because I think all these scientists recognize, oh my gosh, a natural product can give a broader bioshield of benefits than a pure pharmaceutical. Think of that. Three minutes. Okay. Okay, so I have less than three minutes, but I decided what can we all do? So I said, citizen scientists unite, and I invented something called the bee feeder. Bees are maze runners, yellow jackets and hornets are not. Bumblebees are coming to my bee feeder with the extracts. Anyone can hang this anywhere, in your apartment building, on a tree, you know, in the city. And the bees come in, 
And then we will have this AI involved here. We'll upload how many bees are coming into each bee feeder. We have facial recognition uh, being developed right now to count the species of bees that are coming in. And Pam is bringing one of these up. So I've committed to giving away 100,000 of these. So go to bemushroomed.com and sign up. We have 16,000 people signed up. We will have, little, uh, we'll have a solar panel on top. It'll have a, a, a facial recognition devices here. It'll be uploaded into the cloud. We'll be able to measure how many native bees, how many bum bumblebees, how many honeybees are coming in. And I made it so it's transparent, so you can look underneath, and kids can look underneath and see the bees going in. My grandson is fascinated. He has no fear of bees now. I just told him to move in slow motion. And so now kids are getting excited about this, so I hope to deploy 100 million to 2 billion of these in the next five years to be able to stop the pandemic. So, microdiversity is biosecurity. What can you do? I want you to celebrate decomposition. We're all gonna die. You're gonna die. You're gonna decompose. Your ancestors have decomposed to create the soil that would give us the food that we walk and on or we need today. Leave wood on the ground, let it rot. So, to close, humans, trees, bears, Mushrooms, the birds and the bees were all evolved to be interconnected with the mycelial web of life. And today is August 30th, is that correct? I would like to announce and make a proposal, and I need your help to be able to spread this idea. I want a new international holiday, Nature Interdependence Day, that we uh, they recognize the importance of nature, that we are interdependent. In the fabric of nature, where all, all citizens are citizens of this earth and they have rights to be here and they have rights to be protected. They have citizen rights. So I want to say thank you all. We will forever exist within the micromolecular matrix. So let's take off. Thank you.